Richard didn't drink alcohol when he was inside the prison, except for maybe a bit of the overweight, and that was it. Never went in the hooch, just took the overweight. When Richard got to drink that much vodka in the first two years, to try and get rid of the long term memory, he ended up pickling the front lobe of the brain where your short term memory is kept. So Michael's now like a down, eh, sorry, Richard's now like a down syndrome child. He's <coughs> no short term memory, he's still got the horrors. He spent over 150 grand of his, his, of his interest payments on medical bills in Ireland. As far as I'm concerned, the Irish government should have built the British government for that. Because they've done it. These people shouldn't have to spend their own money to put themselves back together. All the media want to talk about is when they come out, and all they want to see is that. Clean your glasses. Get a drink and clean your glasses. That's, that's the picture. I've watched them. I've watched the, the journalists are told to go and get that photograph. Because that's what they want to show. They want to show them having a good time. And basically, skip over the problems. Satish talks about uh, the lack of accountability when it comes to those who are, have committed this crime. Jack Butler was telling me in Robert Brown's case, Jack Butler convicted in 83. They didn't need to run an investigation into Jack Butler. At the trial, the judge actually says, you either believe Robert Brown and you believe the cops. And if you believe Robert Brown, then the cops, these policemen, have colluded together to prevent the course of justice in a grave manner. Convicted Robert Brown. That is appeal. Linguistic experts for both the defence and the Crown both agree that the way Robert Brown was meant to have given his confession and what the police officer said in court was a lie. Well, that to me is perjury. That's it. The appeal court has stated that. But the, the Manchester police <laughs> ran an investigation. They invited in the West Yorkshire police, and this is another thing that they've been doing for the last 15 years and getting away with it. They invited you don't go and investigate. Nobody goes in and says, we're going to go and look at it. Listen, they invite you in, and they invited the neighbouring police force in. And we mean Ralph Brown, we mean, we mean we're in a TV film, let me tell you what's one of it, it's embarrassing. But we met a boy down there, Tony Steele, who put out Ralph Mayer two years into his sentence in 1979. Tony Steele did 22 years. Tony had been out three years when we met him. Tony Steele was done in West Yorkshire in 1979. Now you've got the West Yorkshire Police going to investigate the Greater Manchester Police. What the West Yorkshire Police going to investigate and invite the Greater Manchester Police to investigate Tony Steele? We tried to get IPCC to, to open up this case. They weren't interested either. They're not interested. I mean, we talked about the, the killers, uh, people knowing who the killers are. I, just put, I picked up Paul, Paul Foote's book about Carol Bridgewater. Anybody that knows about that case knows who killed Carol Bridgewater. There's a 12 year old boy gets head blown off. I know who the killer was. I've said to many journalists in the last three or four years, I don't know him. We want him to kill him. The killer wants to take us to court, that'll bring take us to court. The media won't even print it. They don't even go and run this story. And his name's Hubert Spencer, by the way, many of you want to know. Hubert Spencer was the original suspect of the Bridgewater case. Car matched. The uniform was an ambulance man matched. He lied about leaving the, the hospital. He collected the uh, Antiques, the place with an antiques robbery, he knew Carol Bridgewater, he denied that. He also, a month after the, Br the Bridgewater fort was put away, he went in and blew off his mate's head. The same with his upper hand as Carol Bridgewater's death. Two of his friends, he killed him, he blew his head off. The gun cartridges have been never been found that matched, they matched the scene of the crime. The same gun cartridges blew off Hubert Wilk's head. That was a month after the Bridgewater fort was put away. We just seen a program with a girl for four. They knew the Balkan Street bombers that did that as well. They're not interested. So I just like to do a comment. Someone's got a golf course now. Could we hear Paddy speak on their life experiences? <laughs> That's <laughs> charming. <laughs> so you want to leave yourself out there? No, no. <laughs> I'll be, I'll, I'm going to be quick. No, sorry. Oh, <laughs> carry on. Carry on. Carry on. Carry on. I'll carry on. 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 Basically, this is what we're doing. We're doing it the truth. We're, we're wanting to be invited to the trade uh, to union uh, conferences. We want to come and speak at the uh, regional councils. We want to speak wherever we can speak. We, will, we will need to get the trade unions involved in this because it's affecting and it's massively affecting working class communities now. And the way the whole situation is going with this government by wanting to privatise <coughs> business, by wanting to turn this into, it, and it already is a multi-million pound business. They want to make this a privatised multi-million pound business. And you rest assured, It'll be the people in government, it'll be the shareholders and the directors who will be making money off people's misery. And for innocent people who've been locked up in prison, it's going to get even worse because there's more and more and there's less and less people.
get involved with this. And this is why we need people within the trade unions. We need people, we need trade union papers to make our articles on stories we've got. <coughs> As I say, we've got cards here with our web page on it. We'd like people to start looking at our web page. And we tell the truth. We've got nothing to hide. We ain't scared of them. We, we've got another case. Sorry about this one, but I've got to speak. Another oh, case. Oh, Stevie yeah. Johnson. We met a guy recently, and we were shocked by this. And this is what you've got to do. This is how it can happen to you. This is how it can happen. Stevie Johnson got convicted in March 1996. Him and another guy was killing a guy on the 3rd of November 1995. The police said it had only been the 3rd of November. Then we discovered, and he discovered, his lawyer wrote to the PF, that's the DPP in Scotland, six months after he was convicted in June 1996, and asked them about statements that they've been told had been held back to the Crown, to the trial. The head of the Crown Union said, no, all were handed over. In 1997, the solicitors received another letter from the Crown Union. Only this time they stated, the letter that I wrote to you on the 5th of July 1996 was not only misleading, but it was inaccurate. And statements were handed over to the, to the Crown, not the defence, the Crown, so somebody was convicted, the jury convicted somebody and they never heard all the evidence. Two of the witness statements that weren't given, one of them actually was a shopkeeper who met that call on the coast. I know it's true, it's not funny, a guy died, but the way the police are portrayed is the victim who was meant to have died in the 3rd of November walked into a shop on the 4th of November and the guy remembered that. He also remember some cuts above the face because a fight took place on the 3rd of November and Stevie's never denied it. It was his mate that was fighting and Stevie jumped in and pulled him off him. Right? The guy whacked him a couple of times, and that's why the police have decided, well, right, let's just say they murdered him there and then. One witness seen him on the third, uh, fourth, one witness seen him on the fifth, another witness seen him on the eighth of November, the day before the body was found. Two housing officers were ready on the Tuesday, the body was found on the Thursday night. Two housing officers were ready on the Tuesday and looked through the window during the day, never seen a body. All these statements were tucked away. The guy is still in prison. The nonsense in 97 that this has been held back. They were told four years ago to get this case back to the appeal court in Scotland. And the guys still wait to go back to the appeal court. And that's how easy it is to find yourself an innocent person in prison. And it is Kafka. It is, you know, uh, who was the writer? Kafka. No, it's Joseph K. It is a nightmare. And people find themselves in. People don't know how to get out of it. That's a sad thing. Willie Gage was a, was a smart individual and he wrote to us before his trial. And we, we monitor this case. We hopefully will be going to be released in two months' time. And I'm sure he will be released in two months' time. But there are many other cases where people don't know where to turn. They don't know where to go. And particularly down here in England, the situation down here is so great. We need to close our offices because we never had the resources. Because more and more people were coming to us and we couldn't give them a service and there's no much point giving these guys hope because that, yeah, that's the worst thing you can do is give hope and pull it away and therefore we've had to su suspend our offices we are going to reopen them at some point in the future we have kept some cases and we are working with the innocent projects and we are passing cases on to lawyers down here but the situation is very very grave and it is going to get worse because of this government and the laws that they're bringing in to reduce the burden of proof, which we already explained, has been reduced, and if people don't go and start doing something about it, it really could be one of you's next. Cheers.